Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 36, November 22nd through November 28th, 1861. First and foremost, may I say I hope everyone has a very happy Thanksgiving this week, and I do have an announcement as well. I know I mentioned here in a previous episode about Patreon content coming out, and if you have been looking at the Patreon, you might know this, that it has not come out. Uh, so, surprise, um, that should be coming out this week, a little uh, Thanksgiving treat. So, if you want to support the show, there is a link to the Patreon in the description. Last week, we headed out to Oklahoma to begin the Trail of Blood and Ice, starting a series of engagements between factions to control the territory for the Confederacy or the Union. We also got to take a look at some engagements prior to the Civil War on what was, at that time, the frontier, meaning the current-day states of Washington and Nevada. This week, we will stop briefly back down into Florida. I would also like to take this opportunity to talk about another previous engagement before the Civil War, one in which at least some of our leaders gained some experience, such as the President Abraham Lincoln. It's where we also get the Chicago hockey nickname from for those NHL fans. I am speaking, of course, of the Blackhawk War. So, if we recall last time we were in southern Florida, there had been a failed raid against Fort Pickens, resulting in the Battle of Santa Rosa Island. Braxton Bragg is still the Confederate commander in the region around Pensacola. If we also recall, Fort McRee, held by the rebels, was a very short distance from Fort Pickens and would occasionally trade cannon fire with the Federals. McCree was named after Army Engineer Colonel William McCree, built around at the same time as Fort Pickens in an effort to defend Pensacola. On November 22, 1861, there was a combined effort by Fort Pickens and two U.S. naval vessels to concentrate their fire on the Confederate positions. After a sustained bombardment, the guns at Fort McRee would fall silent. This would be the last action that the fort would see during the war. It would sustain a large amount of damage in the process. Remember how the aging fortifications would fare against modern armament. The powder magazine would be damaged and the wooden structures would be mostly burned as a result. Bragg would withdraw his forces from the fort, and eventually Pensacola would be evacuated later in 1862. I think in the list of American wars, classically, I have always thought we go Revolution, 1812, Black Hawk War, Mexican-American War, Civil War. Why the Black Hawk War is in there might not make a whole lot of sense, given the scale of fighting. It is important to note because it will mark the end of the wars for the Northwest Territory. You remember the Northwest Ordinance we talked about in the first few episodes. Fallen Timbers, Tippecanoe, both of these battles we can include in this ongoing war for modern-day Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. We also have in there the Battle of the Wabash in 1791. We sort of talked about that briefly in St. Clair's defeat, the largest defeat by the U.S. military against a Native American force. In the Black Hawk War, we have experiences gained for the leaders of the U.S. and Confederate governments, as well as for folks we already talked about 
like John McLernan, Albert Sidney Johnson, and the hero of Fort Sumter, at least for the Union, Robert Anderson. I'll try to wrap it all together at the end toward further lessons and significance that we will see. First, let's set the scene. Early in the settlement of America along the Mississippi, the French had established healthy trade with native tribes of the area. As a result, many tribes sided with the French in war, notably the French and Indian War. When the French eventually sold their possessions in America, the British would effectively take over this role, especially as they would use the hostile tribes against the fledgling American government. It was during this period of conflict against encroachment that Black Hawk was born into, eventually becoming a Sauk leader. Now, when the United States gained the territory of the Louisiana Purchase, they would work with securing areas with treaties signed with tribes. In 1804, they purchased the area and negotiated with the Sauk, who occupied the area of what is now modern-day Illinois. In less than scrupulous dealings, the Americans got the Sauk drunk and then had them sign over their land. Not cool, especially considering this has William Henry Harrison's stamp all over it. As you can understand, the treaty was widely rejected by many, including Black Hawk. Black Hawk and these dissatisfied Sauk would look toward the British for support. They would fight alongside the British in the War of 1812 as a result. Even after the war, the Sauk would fight against settlers and Americans who built forts on what they thought was their land. On part of the Americans, forts with stronger military presence was seen as necessary toward controlling the new territories. Black Hawk could not understand further encroachment of the land. I think this is a common tale when we talk about these wars on the frontier. There's definitely a misunderstanding in culture. Land ownership is definitely one such concept. Concepts of war and revenge the Americans could not understand on their part. There's one incident in which the Sauk, who were enemies of the Sioux, would massacre American allies outside a fort, which as you might imagine, was not something the Americans inside the fort were okay with. So, even in the 1830s, the British would continue to provide material support to those who opposed the United States. The British Band, as they came to be called, formed. This is because they were in opposition to the American control of their territory. This group, made primarily of our uh, already mentioned Sauk tribesmen, would even fly a Union Jack as an act of open defiance. Henry Atkinson had moved troops north and passed by Black Hawk and this band. General Atkinson was originally from North Carolina and had served his entire career in the Army. Earlier in the 1820s, he conducted two expeditions, making contact with tribes further west. He is actually widely criticized for not eliminating the threat that the British band posed as they moved across the Mississippi into land open for settlement. Iowa, it should be noted, at this time was considered Indian territory. Atkinson wanted to use diplomacy rather than force against Black Hawk and his sock. He would call for a council, but this was ineffective. Local settlers would call for the creation of militia units to defend against the hostiles. Billy Hamilton, son of Alexander Hamilton, helps to raise troops. It was during this volunteer spree that Lincoln would join up and be elected captain by other volunteers. We have already actually discussed this practice of electing officers, which, as you know now, was actually still in place at the start of the Civil War. Of 
the militia would be mounted key to catching Blackhawk and his likewise mounted band. I think it is important to really understand what exactly Blackhawk was looking for. Yes, general opposition to American settlement and reclaiming land was a goal. I think it should also be mentioned that when Andrew Jackson took office, he initiated the spoil system. This, as you might have guessed by the name, is a system where the party and supporters of the winning president are rewarded with positions. This could have an effect on government positions like, say, Indian agents. Those of lesser quality might be placed into these positions, and obviously this wouldn't go well toward the relationships with uh, the tribes that they are acting as agents for, so that would cause potential friction. The British ban would seek allies in pushing against the settlement of territory, traditionally Sauk. Blackhawk would ask for help from Winnebago's, and Potawatomi tribes. These tribes were mixed into areas now west of the Mississippi. It is during this courtship of allies that General Atkinson would respond to a raid conducted by the band. Cabins and settlers would fortify positions as a result to the hostile bands in the area. Men under the command of Isaiah Stillman would approach the British band at this time. We do not really know a whole lot about what happened next. I've seen some places where Blackhawk was buying time, maybe a ruse even. I've also seen where Blackhawk was giving up and wanted to head back across the Mississippi, not having accomplished his goal of gaining a large set of allies. However we cut it, Blackhawk would want to talk to the militia, and at some point fighting breaks out. Sock and allied fox warriors would strike back at Stillman's men. The battle would be known as Stillman's Run, as the militia was driven off. Lincoln would actually arrive with his company and view the aftermath of the battle. Those militiamen left behind had been mutilated, a sight that would stick with the future president for the rest of his life. Sailors would abandon many of their homes as a result, now fearful of the British band and the incapability of the militia seemingly to stop them. High off their initial success, raids would be conducted by the victorious band. A massacre of settlers at Indian Creek would occur shortly afterward, in which there were only two survivors. Fifteen, including six children, were killed. A traveling minister is also killed, as well as others in the area. Hands, head, and feet were often removed in these massacres. Hearts were also eaten in certain cases, which was not going well to easing the minds of the settlers now holed up in forts. And you thought maybe that was just something that James Fenmore Cooper came up with when he wrote Last of the Mohicans. While raids were being conducted, the keeping of the Winnebago from joining with the hostiles was of utmost importance. Relations were complicated, some were sympathetic, some remained allied with the Americans. In a twist, Winnebago's would actually help in the release of captured settler women from raids in May of 1832. Oddly enough, the same Winnebago's would then turn on the settlers under Henry Dodge. Dodge would capture White Crow, the Winnebago leader, keeping the peace for a time. Violence would still erupt, with Winnebago's raiding several settlers, resulting in some fatalities. It was a complex situation, as there were some who wanted to wage war, and others who wanted to remain allied to the United States. This added pressure would help out the war effort, as Dodge would play a bigger part in recruiting of additional volunteers. For a period of time, only some 300 militia remained, including Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, in Washington, Jackson would send Winfield Scott to replace Atkinson due to his dissatisfaction at the progress. Atkinson would move quickly in an attempt to end the war before Scott's arrival. The pursuit of the British band using mounted militia, who could move at a more rapid pace, was key, as we have already mentioned. At Wisconsin Heights, Blackhawk would attempt a delaying action against a numerically superior force of volunteers, but was repulsed with large numbers of casualties. As many as 60 warriors were killed, compared to one American fatality. The chase for the rest of the British band would continue. By this point, the Sock and Fox were running low on supplies, even eating horses to survive. They would attempt to negotiate, raising a white flag, but in one of the more unfortunate incidents of the conflict, the militia would open fire from a steamboat and inflict over 20 casualties. On August 2nd, at the Battle of Bad Axe, the war would come to a conclusion. The overwhelming numbers of militia won the day, with only 14 casualties. Many of the British band were killed, including women and children, who drowned attempting to escape. Dakota Sioux and other native allies of the Americans would kill many of the remaining members of the band, the Sioux being enemies of the Sauk, as previously mentioned. Half of the nearly 1,000 strong British band had perished during the Black Hawk War, as opposed to almost 80 Americans. Young Lieutenants Jefferson Davis and Robert Anderson would escort the imprisoned Black Hawk back to Virginia. This conflict would mark the conclusion of the wars from the Northwest Territory, as we already talked about in the beginning of the rundown. Although there were not as many figures of the Civil War engaged in this conflict, there are still some takeaways I think we can apply to our overall story. I think this conflict combined with the Mexican-American War serves as a good example of the value in volunteer troops. Militia units back in the Revolutionary War was subpar compared to regulars. In fact, sort of famously in several Revolutionary War battles, the job of the militia was simply to loose off one round before they broke and ran, and this was really all that could be expected of them as compared to U.S. regular troops. But as you can see in the Black Hawk War, it's the militia units that really bring the war to a conclusion as opposed to the U.S. regular troops who don't actually arrive under Winfield Scott. In Mexico, there is a conflict between regular U.S. troops and volunteers. Volunteers are still seen as unruly. So there is this weird mix in certain instances in the Civil War where you sort of have this older way of thinking and then you also have the newer way of thinking when it comes to volunteer and militia units. Cavalry against the non-woodland tribes of the east will be the preferred unit. Once you get out onto the plains, mobility will become important to sustaining tactical advantages. Second, we may be able to see Abraham Lincoln's inspiration when forming his army in 1861. He wanted volunteers, men who actually wanted to join up and fight. Maybe his experience as a volunteer captain, as well as the effectiveness of his comrades, could have led to this preference. After all, it is the sole military experience for Lincoln prior to the Civil War. We can draw to a close. Today, we went to southern Florida and checked in very briefly on the situation down there. After that, we had a look at the Black Hawk War, which gives Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln military experience back in 1832. Next week, we have another slower episode as we get into December of 1861. It seems like it could be a good time to get into the Mexican War experiences and takeaways we talked about recently. I want to get more into motivations 
and attitudes of Civil War soldiers as well. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. And once again, may I say happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. And when I think about the things that I am thankful for, certainly one of those on the top of the list here are all of you who have decided to listen to this podcast. So thank you all so much for listening and have a great week week.